May 24th, 2017. It is a Wednesday. It's going to be a good day. Junkie Gathering is here. More and more people are piling in by the day, the hour, really. So it's going to the be the hours, good. right? Sometimes the minute. That it really is. They're either landing or they're here or they're on their way. Yep. I see people uh, in first class. They're sending us stuff. It's crazy, man. We got, so, Dan so we, we got a listener from New Zealand that's coming. And he was flying first class, so that was good to see. First class, as he should. Yeah. So. All right. Yeah, Dan Stuff is here with us today. Yeah. So if that was. Jason, you breathing into the mic? What? You got a deviated septum there or what? No. What's that? Go, goes put it closer to my mouth. Okay. I, I, I thought I was co-hosting with Michael Myers there for a second. <laughs> I don't know. Why. This is your captain speaking. We are making our descent into Las Vegas McCarran Airport. On behalf of our crew, we'd like to thank you for flying MMA Junkie Airlines. Now please fasten your seatbelts and put your tray tables in your upright position because the descent is going to be a little bit bumpy. <laughs> All right, Junkie Nation, it's time to roll, baby, on MMA Junkie Radio with gorgeous George and Ghost. This is what we do and why we do it, baby. All night long, we roll it! Yes! The MMA Junkie Radio Revolution is upon us. Can you dig it? There's no escape. No escape. Through the vast frontier of cyberspace and through a sea of stars in outer space. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. We've solidified our combat yes. communication stranglehold. We are controlling transmission. With the use of MMA Junkie Radio and Sirius XM satellite radio technology. MMA Junkie Radio. Commence transmission. <laughs> Live from MMA Junkie Radio HQ in the fight capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada. Here are your hosts, Gorgeous George and Go. From the fight capital of the world, inside the beautiful Mandalay Bay Racing Sportsbook, you are listening to the MMA Junkie Radio Show. I'm your host, Gorgeous George. With me, as always, is the devious and dastardly goes, our ace co-host slash producer slash coffee runner slash water grabber. I don't know. He's out there being a gopher sitting to my... Left is our co-host for the day, Jason Buckemer, the intern, Jason B. from the Goof. Yep. What up, cuz? I'm good. How about good, you? Good, good, all right. How you feeling? Michael Russo, back east, producing. I'm feeling all right. My back, doing, pinched guys? nerve, you know, and danced up, sitting to the right, probably getting ready to fire someone. He hasn't smiled all morning, so I can, <laughs> I can already tell the face is buried in the laptop and someone's getting a two-week notice, right? Kenny, me, you, I don't know, goes. One of us getting fried. What's up, Dan? How you doing? You might want to check your email. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be me. How about that? So it's uh, a bit of do today. Yeah, Junkie Gathering, man, you were, you were saying it's popping, right? Man, it's on fire. Yeah, we had like 30 or 40 people out at the uh, at the fields yesterday. Yep. Uh, kudos to Extreme Couture. Extreme Couture defeated us by a score of 8 to 4. Uh, 8 touchdowns to 4. You know, we weren't doing the whole extra point. They did get a safety. I'll give them that. But we hung tough. We scored the first TD, mm -hmm. and we got it as close to what could have been 6-4 to four on an arguable, controversial call. And then after that, they basically – I think the, the better conditioned athletes just started to wear on us. I think we were doing some finger pointing, a.k.a. I was pointing. I was an asshole, man. I was a coach. Yeah, you were a little bit of a dick. I was the coach, and I had to, I had to uh, basically tell people, get off the field because – for one, it's seven on seven, and we had nine. I had to tell two people get off the field. And I was trying to figure out a balance of who's been on the field for a while, who got burned recently, or who may have dropped a pass recently, and then obviously speed kills, man, speed kills. So I wanted to try and match them up when I thought the game was close. When I thought the game was starting to get away, I was like, just who wants to play? But early on, really, it was like, if you haven't played, step up. And we were trying to get some fresh bodies in. Um... But what, what are you going to do, you know? I mean, if we wanted to win, then I had to make those types of decisions. And uh, and for a while, it looked like we could at least have a good showing, compete, maybe have a shot, and then after a while, whatever. And then we went to the barbecue. But I did think about it. I sent a lot of people off the field. I threw my hands up. Dan, when, when we got scored on, I threw my hands up. I couldn't have made anyone feel like more of a zero as they were walking <laughs> off the field as I would glare at them. Yeah, I called Jason Lackey Toast because he got burned. <laughs> 
And I go, he toast. I go, get off, you know. Now, to his credit, he grabs, he saved the TD once. He dove and grabbed, grabbed the flag. He was playing barefoot. So he was hustling. He wanted to win, man. That's what I liked about him. So I came at him a little more. Jason B got burned once, too. Danny, the producer, dropped the pass. Jeffrey, uh, he was out there, like, on roller skates. He didn't know which way to go. And so it, it, it was fun, man. We all got to play against pro fighters, you know. Um, it, it was fun, but yeah, I, I was. Yeah, it, it sounded like a real sound like fun blackjack. time, George. Yeah, <laughs> it sounded like blackjack. <laughs> Anyone else you want to throw under the bus? <laughs> Can't wait to join his team, right? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, okay, if, if if anyone's sitting at home going, "Why are you such an asshole?" I'm like, "Well, fuck." I mean, it wasn't like. <sighs> are you that guy starting fights like at little league games no. and stuff, like arguing? I, with the I actually had to put <laughs> out fires. I had to put out fires. They were arguing over third down and fourth down and this and that. Hey, you know what? For a while, we looked like buffoons. Like there was ten of us. I'm like, for one, we need seven, not ten. You know, and then there was a few guys that were like, you know, like, yeah, yeah, you know. I'm just going to play every play, and and, uh, and the others will have to rotate. The other six will have to rotate, so I had to make those decisions like, nah, you've kind of been on the field for a while. So that's why, to you defend myself. You need to get myself. control of your team. You're, you're, you're losing the franchise. We, could we, be. we did better than he, you know, he's saying. I we thought we were going to get smoked, 35 nothing. We scored the first TD, and the guys started showing heart. But uh, a lot of times the guys were just lost, you know. So uh, It was clearly a case of poor coaching. I agree. <laughs> what do you think, goes? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we could have won the game, man. Yeah, you know, and it, you know, it's, sorry if I'm competitive, but I I thought we could have won the game. I mean, it, you know, and, and these guys are are really really good athletes. They were flying. They just wouldn't get tired. You know, a few of and our you guys, guys were playing tired. like in a hundred and three degree heat yesterday. It was a hundred and three degree heat. Yeah. So whatever, you know. But uh, if I'm hated less or more, I'll just have to take it. I don't know. Uh, Goes just kind of like drifted off on the sideline and let me take most of the heat. I wish he would have <laughs> been a co-coach so he could take half the heat. But he just kind of like floated and blended in and uh, whatever. It, that was very – it was a savvy move by Goes. Yeah, I heard he was feeding plays to the other team. Me? <laughs> no, Goes was. That's why he was so quiet. Uh, so no, but, you know, I, I was feeding info to the guys. Like I was telling the guys, he's coming at you. He's coming at you, you know. I, I couldn't do anything about it. I was on the sidelines, and sure enough, a lot of the times they were coming at our guys. And I, and here's another thing I said. Give them everything underneath, but don't get burned. Four of their TDs, at least, I remember, over our safeties. And we were playing deep, and they were still getting past us. I'm like, if you're going to be that deep, at least bat it down or intercept it. No, it was going right over them. And they're just watching it. <laughs> well, so, well, so people know, like, you guys weren't playing against a bunch of jabronis. You, who were you guys playing Extreme against? Extreme Couture. Right, like, who exactly? Uh, Brad Tavares, Johnny Nunez, Eric Nixick, uh, Boston Sam, and uh, Justin Edwards. I mean, so, yeah, that they had some. You can't get too disappointed getting beat by professional athletes. Apparently you, know? so, you can. Uh, well, I, I take that <laughs> bad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and then check Unless it out. George. And then <laughs> check it out. It's like T-Rex arms. People can't grab flags. And <laughs> there's the lack of hustle, man. Like. Did you see the way, like, Marvin, when he was running our guy, or one of our star you players? bring him in here, like, in the locker yeah, room? Yeah, bring him, him in here. <laughs> Fuck them. Wait, Marvin, when he was running, he's spinning, but they're all grabbing for his flag. Sometimes his ass, sometimes his cock, sometimes a flag, sometimes his shirt. It didn't matter, right? He was getting attacked. He was getting mauled. I think he called the rape crisis line afterwards because he was assaulted so much. But on our end, like, they would run, and if they, like, got it, oh, great. And if not, they just kind of stand there and watch, and then someone else, and, like, <laughs> It was, I don't know. I was like, come on, grab for them flags. It, right, Goes? A little bit. Yeah, I mean, like. Yeah. <sighs> who took home the MVP trophy? Who, who was I have to give Eric Nixick or Brad Tavares. Brad Tavares put a lot of pressure. By the way, that guy, I, he must have skipped math because somehow he'd go from one <laughs> alligator to five alligator and he'd be <laughs> on our quarterback's face. But that guy was an amazing pass rusher. We had to put two guys to block him. And then uh, Eric Nixick, their quarterback, their general manager, I mean, he was just burning us. So I was telling the guys, contain him. Don't rush him. Contain him. Right, and when we contained them, we forced them to pass, and now we have unathletic fighters who are just kind of dropping a few passes themselves, not running. Go ahead and name names. It was frustrating. Yeah. It, uh, who are the unathletic? I can't remember their names. <laughs> yeah. It was frustrating, Eric. But you know, Eric also underthrew a few. So I realized we weren't all professionals out there, but I felt like there was a certain strategy we could get them with. And the competitive juices started coming out. Who was the team junkie MVP and besides the head coach, of course? Uh, Sam sh from Chicago, the chef. He cooked a, a nice barbecue for everyone. Wow. And he was there that grilling was your top performer for about yesterday. three, four <laughs> hours, man, sweating in that heat, and he brought it. Uh, but I guess uh, Marvin and Jason Lackey. Marvin yeah. Jason Lackey? Jason Lackey. He had two clear over his hands. He's right there. <laughs> Look, he's even nodding. <laughs> 
Oh, I, no, I did give him credit. I, he was grabbing flags. He saved tackles. He was grabbing flags. But there was a couple that just went over his head, you know, and I was like, oh, the man. The man played barefoot. That's dedication right there. It is, it is. But, Jason, let me see. Our MVP was what I, I think Brett Akamoto. He did throw away an interception, but I think he threw a TD and intercepted one and, and almost ran it back. That's true. Um, this, is, this is Brett Akamoto from ESPN. From ESPN, yeah. yeah. The guy who broke, like, three huge stories last night while also playing. Oh, he texted me, too. He goes, <laughs> I may not be able to go. There's some stories. Next thing you know, he shows. Because, by the way, everyone just feels like, I, you know, they can just text me. Like, I'm just doing nothing. I'm the, I'm the fucking junkie gathering info guy. <laughs> I mean, we've been saying it for the last year. These are the dates. This is where we stay. You know, this is where things are happening. But, yeah, like, I'm getting – like, I'm in the middle of, of third down and fourth down, and somebody's going like, hey, man, uh, what sideline are you guys on? I'm like, just fucking – Look, there's extreme <laughs> couture people over there, and there's a bunch of junkies over here. You what know, the I mean, crazy guy flaming. Holy oh, yeah. shit! <laughs> yeah, look for the crazy guy. Like, what <laughs> side? I'm here. What <laughs> sideline are you on? I got, I got that text. I looked at it. I go, you can't tell. Our producer's got blue hair. He's right there. <laughs> Goes is on camera every fucking day. You don't see him. He's right there. It's gonna just look for the sideline where you don't have professional fighters. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a more there's clearly a more fit side on that side, and five of them have extreme couture on them. I I couldn't believe that text. So uh, there was a lot of frustrations happening. The chef forgot the lighter fluid. Um, you know, so I'm I'm putting out those fires. Hey man, Trying you know like, <laughs> uh, that's why I'm that's why I'm fla uh, fanning them right now. Where, wh what happened to you? I got stuck with some calls and <laughs> I, I'll, I'll have to explain. He got drunk. No, he got a text he, saying, he, he, he "Don't was, come." George is going right. crazy. I'm not, I, yeah, I'm not I buying did, this. I didn't know where it was at, and I wanted to text you, but I knew you'd blow up on me. So blackjack <laughs> downtown drinking the spearmint rhino, or he took a nap. Which one? The truth. What, it, it's more in what order? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It was fun. I apologize to Junkie Nation if I yelled at you, if I benched you, if I removed <laughs> no, you, you don't, forcefully. No, you you just threw him under the bus again. <laughs> well, I, well, now it's coming to, like, that I'm realizing there was uh, asshole mode. But, Ghost, <laughs> Ghost, please give me some credit. You did tell me take charge, or right? Yeah. When there was nine people on the field, I had to c cut it down to seven. But I couldn't tell what your strategy was. Because at some point, you wanted everyone to play, but at other points. Speak close to his mic. On, on other points, you were like, this fucking guy is killing us. I was like, hey, man, you got to pick one or the other. You can't make them all happen. <laughs> did I really but say you know, that? Yeah, you did. Loud? loud. Not to you? <laughs> no, super loud. But I want to give them this, this credit, which what I thought was really cool, was this is like 10 minutes, 15 minutes after the game. It's a text from the general manager of Extreme Couture. And he says, thanks again, fellas. Absolutely love being a part of your family. And then Brad Tavares, uh, right after that, was just wanted to say thanks, guys. I had a great time. Sorry I couldn't hang. I'm beat. He just had pro practice. He just got beat up. I know. He's, and they he's in the middle of a camp. In a camp man. He fights and Elias Theodoru here in about six weeks, and he came out and and, uh, and competed. You know, I don't know what Johnny Nunez's situation is, but you saw him featured in the reality show last week. Mm -hmm. He could he could be part of a, of, a, of, a, of a finale, or he may not. I don't know, but he came out. The recently retired Misha Tate was out there. Mm -hmm. She said, I'm going to sit in the middle between Junkie Nation and Extreme Couture. <laughs> so she sat uh, towards the end of the end zone. She did come out to the barbecue. and then, But, uh, yeah, that was very nice of them to say. Uh, those guys, they told me, like, literally, I had a blast. I had a good time, man. That was a lot of fun. Um, we had a little bit of, of drama. That was cool because... The, okay, if we just went out there and said everyone had a good time, patted each other on the back, and we all high fived, well, we'd be talking about MMA now. We'd be talking about Dillashaw, Demetrius John. But no, we're talking about all these side plots, throwing people onto the bus, asshole stories, this, that, whatever. It has to happen. There has to be bad with good. Otherwise, it wouldn't be as good of a story. You guys realize that? Right? If there's a meltdown on the field or on the sideline or wherever, that's all funny to me. It was funny. Yeah, here's another funny thing. Our guys, Junkie Nation, don't know what a sideline is. <laughs> like, literally, they'd be, like, 10, 10 feet onto the field. Now, I appreciate, like, they're yelling and go guys or whatever, but I'm like, get back. I Did you give them a sideline warning? I, had, they to, doing the I, I had to tell them, get back. <laughs> huh? The, the sprinklers? Yeah. yeah, maybe. The sprinklers went off, <laughs> so we were all wet. But it, it added to it. Brad felt at home because it rains in Hawaii, like, two hours a day. <laughs> so um, you could tell there was, there was some of the guys that play on his flag football team. And they were kind of organized. They knew how to contain and, and blitz and rush and count and this and that. 
Uh, man, it, it was fun, and I didn't even play. I had a good time. But, again, Junkie Nation, sorry if I grabbed you by the shirt and said get off the field. We either needed to get down to seven, or you had just made a bad play. And if you had just made a bad play, take it like a man because not everyone out there made great plays. Eric threw an interception. Brett, Brett threw an interception. So a lot of people did bad plays. But, uh, I mean, that's how it is in the pros, right? A coach fucking slaps you in the helmet and says, get off the field and switch it and this and that. For next year's game, I'm getting him a red sweater to wear like Bobby Knight on the sideline. And <laughs> a, chair? Him a chair? A chair. <laughs> so, yeah. So, like, I feel <laughs> terrible, but Danny missed one. It would have been a first down, and I'm looking at him, and he's shaking his head. But I love Danny, but at that moment, I had to tell you, oh, because we could have got a first. Jason, I think, got burned. Jason Lackey, I think, got burned. And I was like, oh, so if you saw me do that. That was me. Th just I thought we could make that play. I thought we could win. You you got guys lined up right now, just waiting to charge you. Like yeah. just keep doing, keep talking, George. Like our veterinarian, <laughs> my cousin, <laughs> my cousin Jeffrey, our veterinarian Ryan from Sacramento. They're just kind of like floating around. <laughs> I'm like, commit to the ball or don't get burned. And just <laughs> it was kind of funny, man. Oh, but you know what? We had three practices, so a lot of us. It was a core of about ten that kind of had a strategy in place. And there was times, and again, now this is, I'm going to throw goes into the bus a little. There was a couple times where I looked and I go, we got ten, we got seven guys on the field. Six of them got off the plane about four hours ago. One doesn't have cleats. One guy's got bright pink pants on going on. He's, he's a, the lead singer of a band. He's, you know, he's trying the best to figure out what's we, – we really didn't have a strategy. So what I was trying to do was blend some of the guys that had played – with some of the guys that hadn't played, you know. But when I when I wasn't making moves, Junkie Nation was taking it on their own, and sometimes you'd have a collective seven guys that didn't know anything, right, Goes In terms of what, like, who to guard, whether it was a zone, whether it was a man-to-man. -man, so I, ha I have to say that was probably our bad. Could have used a little help there, Goes. Um, <laughs> he just goes, okay, yeah. <laughs> what, what, what happened was um, there was one point where I was you, where I was like, we need this guy, we need that guy, and then you told me, now, man, we got to get everyone played. This guy hasn't played yet. You're so right. I go, if, we're at, if we're at that point, then I guess, you know, seven guys, it doesn't matter, they haven't played. I did say about 70 things derogatory towards myself. Let me say one good thing. I did clearly say, has anyone not played? And if they didn't, I did my best to get them in the game. That was the one nice thing I did. Everyone, everyone played. That was really sweet of you, George. <laughs> yeah. Everyone, everyone You're played. Really, You're a real <laughs> sweetheart. Hey, what? Danny, when he missed it, George, this was your, mer your worst moment. You did this. You went, fuck! <laughs> 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 that was the worst part. But, okay, it was in his hand. It was in the bread basket. <laughs> Just bring it in, you know? Bring it in. I think we had a first. It was key. Yeah, that's my reaction. I mean, that's you hate me, Danny? Are we good? Yeah, yeah, talk. <laughs> Danny's coming over. Grab all the guys that yelled at. If they want to cuss at me, they can cuss at me. Yeah. Oh, man. This is Danny, the producer. Danny Elkers, what's up? I'll be. Uh, is that one on? He raises mic. Yeah, yeah. All right. Go for it, Danny. Check, check. Hey, hey, hey. I'll be completely honest. That was not the time that bothered me at all because I missed it, and I said that in my head okay. the exact same time you were saying it out loud. I never got burned, so I will say that. I didn't I, say you got burned. I know, I know. Yeah. But uh, the, time, <laughs> the time where I was like, fucking shit was uh, you, you, you asked, who, who hasn't been in yet? And I raised my hand, and, like, three other guys raised their hand, and you were like, you, you, you. And then you, like, stopped. And then, like, two seconds later, you go, Danny. And, and I, I went over to you, and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. You go, we need to go get stuff from the car. <laughs> 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 I was like, Well, you yeah. know, I, uh, I guess I picked the three I felt the most comfortable with to go uh, get the stuff in the car if you weren't, <laughs> if you weren't in the game. Um, but, yeah. Uh, all right, so. That was my the bad. One, that my was bad. the only time I was like, oh, really?" Oh, so so I had every right to be mad at the at the drop ball then. Oh right? no, I was I yeah, I was just as oh, pissed cool. off at that right. point cuz I had it. I yeah, had we had it. we had three big cases of water and uh my I I'm not kidding guys, I really did pinch my nerve in my back. And so I was I still helped. I think I carried a cooler, you know, but I wasn't going to carry them all, man. It was like 97. So we're good? We're good. Fist bump. All right, bring in Jason Lackey. Jason Lackey. I, know, I know I yelled at him a few times. <laughs> this him, him and I have yelled at each other for like the last 36 hours. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Jason Lackey? What's up, boys? Hey, by the way, credit to Jason Lackey. He is the captain of Team Get Danny, the producer, out to Vegas. So thank you for doing that. 
with a lot of help. Yeah. With yeah, you did have your crew. Yeah, you, you want to give them some shout outs? You, you have them all lined up or you have a list? Uh I got a list. Should I get a shout out? Yeah. Right. Was, it wasn't just just Jason Lackey. He it was his idea, but I guess a few others chipped in, so that was very cool. So the list is sorry, I wasn't prepared for this. Martin from Hawaii. Martin Stabilo. Mindra. Team Mindra. That's Kendra and Mike from Humboldt. Buffalo Blue. From Charlotte, North Carolina. Rico. Johnny Rico? Johnny from Rico. From Huntington Beach, California. Dean. Dean from Georgia. The Fedor, Fedor Sweater. Fedor Sweater, who came to the first gathering, never came back again. Muna. Muna. All right, from San Francisco. And Joe from Odessa, who's not going to be able to make this it. This is his first time missing it, I think, too. Yep. Joe from Odessa is the one that provides those leather bracelets to us. Thanks, guys, for, for doing that, man. That, that was a great shocker, a great surprise for both Goes and I. It's on Facebook if you want to see our genuine reactions. All right, let's get to the game. Um, burnt toast. <laughs> burnt toast. First of all, you were on the field. You were hustling. You were diving. You were grabbing flags. You were tackling. You have heart. You have you have the same spirit as I do. You wanted to win, right? I wanted to win. He was coming off the field going, we can do this. We can do this. We can do this. So that was cool. But, yeah, a couple times when the ball went over your head, I may have given you that. You fucked up. You know, I did, though. You fucked up. And. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and and I'm mad right now. Look, so I apologize for being too. It's all good. It's yeah. a sport. Yeah. Coaches get fired up too, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, this is easier than I thought. Okay, I thought I was gonna get it worse. Hey, you know what the best moment though was? Yeah. At one point, George goes, "Hey, the food's looking like it's getting kind of ready. Why don't we just call this?" <laughs> and him and about three other people said, "Fuck that. We play till the end." That was awesome. All right. Yeah, he's intense, man. Right this, on. This, this, is, this is the man right here. Uh, G State Warriors. Props to your team. Right on. Right on. Uh. The Cavaliers won, right? Yeah. So you guys are close to making it. They, they need to win Cleveland one more game. Cleveland versus Golden State. Yeah. All right, cool. You having a good time out here? Loving it, man. Just right. the beginning, though. Thanks for the support of the sure. show. Thanks no for problem. coming out. Seriously, thanks for getting No problem, Danny dude. Out. Thank All you. Right. Thank All you. Right. Take care. Cheers. All right, so, Jason, um, I yelled at you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, go ahead. Not as bad as these guys. Tell me what you think. I mean, you didn't say, fuck. You just <laughs> said, get your ass back there when I was – playing safety but i came up to cover someone because someone was wide open and then they <laughs> hit us over top so we were a little distraught when it yeah. came to game planning and they did have man man five foot ten 155 guys that could fly that is and so true. jason's like what six two six four yeah and i'm slow as i'm a slow way guy four. i mean these guys are running by our guys like our guys are standing still but our guys like legs are moving but i think what it was the most and this is everyone i don't think there was an exceptional flag grabber other than jason lackey maybe um, it, it just looked like instead of grabbing the flag, you ever see a rodeo? Yeah. When the clowns avoid the bull, that's what it looked like. Some of our guys when they were running, it was like, well, I'm not gonna tackle. I'll just sit time. back here. I'm like, he's not a bull, and you're not a clown. Go to him. There's and one yet, and tank take the flag off. You one know. One time it was fourth and goal, and they're about ten yards back, and Johnny Nunez got a little dump off pass, and we had about three guys sitting there within five yards. Don't let him in the end zone, and he just kind of juked around and walked in. Yeah, yeah that, that that and their strategy. Did you see Brad? He would actually grab people's shirts and then take off the flag. And then Brad one time just goes, "I'm just not going to count alligators." And I go, "Why? Because you didn't give us the last call." I'm like, "Well, you're blatantly bla breaking a rule." I had to go face up against Eric once and Brad arguing for yards or placement or this and that. I guess that's why I was getting a little fired up. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, uh, barbecue was fun though, right? Oh, it was delicious. Yeah, delicious. Best food. I've had it in a while. Yeah, Sam from Chicago, our MVP. Yeah. Uh, who are our field MVPs? Brett, Brett Okamoto, Jason Lackey, who else? And Marvin. Marvin. Marvin was a stud. Yeah, he had to get going. A few of our guys had to just leave. Well, you know what we failed to get was like a team picture. Extreme Couture did a team picture. Yeah. It was cool. I saw them in the distance. They all lined up, and uh, all of us didn't. We, we, uh, we had a nice sideline, too. I heard some guys just didn't want to come around the coach. They were a little scared. After. Is that what it was? Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, uh, we, we better take a commercial here. It's MMA Junkie Radio on Series 6 and Rush 93. Look, when we come back, I want to get your reaction. TJ Dillashaw is going to drop to 125 pounds, and he's going to face Demetrius Johnson. Demetrius Johnson. Or mo possibly not, because DJ said he doesn't want the fight. Oh, so that's, and I think that's the latest. Just, yeah. Okay. Wow. Um, well, we'll talk about that. First of all, are you warm to the fight? So DJ has a chance to break Anderson Silva's record. He tied it. This would be to break it. Dillashaw, who was scheduled to fight Cody Garbrandt, that fights off because Cody Garbrandt is pulling a GG. He's got back issues as yeah. well. Even though you've seen a poster or tickets going on sale with Cody Garbrandt on it, it does not appear that he'll be fighting here at UFC 213, headlining uh, International Fight Week. 
So Dillashaw versus DJ, they're talking about that in August. Also, Whitaker and Yoel Romero, that got made for the interim title. Are you guys feeling that? Or would you rather wait for Bisping's comeback and have Yoel Romero step in and fight? I know I'm going to hear both sides, but I think it makes sense. I think that fight makes sense that they have to, that they have to uh, fight each other. The winner would get a clear shot at Bisping since GSP, the sweepstakes are over. All right, I want to hear about that when we come back. 866-522-2846. It's MMA Junkie Radio on Sirius XM, Rush 93. Danced up in the house.
the set of the Fast and the Furious for being too loud and too good looking. Once again, here's gorgeous George and Goes. I'm following up on a story here. It's on the front page of MMA Junkie, Flyweight Champ. Demetrius Johnson throws a wrench in the plan for TJ Dillashaw at UFC 213. I'm trying to put myself in the mind of Demetrius Johnson. Let me read the quote or his tweets. Just so the world knows, I haven't agreed to anything. Still waiting on my contract to fight. Tazmex UFC, which would be uh, uh, so, uh, Ray Bork. Mm -hmm. Not TJ Dillashaw if he wants a title. Shot, he can come to flyweight and then get his <coughs> turn. Well, I think I thought that's what I had read yesterday. That Dillashaw would drop to 125. Yeah, and, and it's not like he's asking for a catch weight. Yeah, and this plan came up before. I think Dana had talked about it after a, a recent event a, a week or two ago. And even at that time, Demetrius said he didn't think Dillashaw was deserving and that there's other flyweight or, or true flyweights who, who deserved it. So I, I think, you know, I, I think a, a part of this, and, and, and I think rightfully so and, and, and good for him, is DJ kind of putting his foot down with the UFC or at least realizing that, if I'm about to break Anderson Silva's record, I'm the number one pound for pound fighter in the sport. I'm probably the most dominant guy in my div in most dominant guy in my respective division, and and I think he feels like he was possibly getting pushed around a bit. And I, I kind of like seeing a guy take a stand, and especially a guy like him who, for many years, just kind of went along with the flow, even when it maybe didn't benefit him. Or, or I, I think he's realizing he's in a position to call his shots now, and. I'd love to hear his reasoning, you know, beyond just saying that, you know, Dillashaw's a bantamweight and I've got flyweights. Um, I, I think part of it's him wanting to stick up for his division and the guy in the divisions, but I think part of it, too, is, you know, he's kind of feeling like he's getting pushed around a bit, you know, by the bosses. So, Well, what'll be interesting is if Dana White can come up with two sheets of paper that say Dillashaw equals this amount, Borg equals this amount, and if, I, if maybe that makes him go, oh, I get it, like, because Dillashaw... If we go back about a year or two, Dillashaw was the bantamweight champ. Yep. DJ was the flyweight champ. Do you remember there was a press conference or something? Uh, I think Johnson started it by saying, I'll fight Dillashaw for $2 million. He was throwing that around back then. It was even before Conor and Nate Diaz had started a new trend of, you know, a new wave of money sh uh, money shots, money fights. <laughs> Sorry, I was watching I was watching uh, X-Ray. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so, <laughs> but, but anyway, things changed around a little bit. Dillashaw is no longer the champ. Demetrius is still the champ. Demetrius is proud of being a flyweight. Says he'll fight there for another 10 fights if he has to. Blah, blah, blah. But he also realizes, wow, I'm the Fox King. I'm not the pay-per-view king. How do I do this? He's starting to speak up, defend himself a little bit more. But, uh, you know, how much of a say he has versus what the promoter says. Look, this is who you're fighting. A, a lot of it will have to do with uh, a dollar sign. But it'll be interesting to see if they if they can huddle up and make a wise decision together. Now Borg has earned a shot. Oh yeah. You know, um, you know he's beaten some quality flyweights. You know, the Benavides sweepstakes are just done for now because a he's not fighting Ben Win and b he's got an injury that'll keep him sidelined for a bit. Aside from that, Dillashaw, it's you know even <sighs> he's only entering into this because I think because of what happened with Garbrandt. You can't blame him. And he's politely and respectfully said, look, that was Benavides' shot, but he can't do it now. That's why I'm coming into this. So I, I don't know that it's, like, it's not the most absurd thing I've ever heard. Whereas, like, GSP out of nowhere, four-year layoff, fighting in a division he's never fought before, him coming in, that seemed absurd to me. This one doesn't seem too bad. Do you want to see it, Jason? I would love to see it. I mean, it's kind of a super fight that a lot of fans would love to see. It's not absurd for him to say, hey, you know what? Cody's out of the picture now. I'm not at 213. Let me slide in here. The fans want it. Who do you want to see? So I, I wouldn't mind seeing that fight. I understand where Mighty Mouse is coming from, seeing Ray Borg does deserve a title shot, and he wants to give it to a flyweight who has earned it. And I feel with this whole GSP and the Bisping thing, now a lot of fighters and fans don't like line cutters. So I feel like people may think, oh, TJ's jumping the line, right? Just right. wait your turn. You and Cody rebook it down the line somewhere in the summer or the fall. So I understand that. But does TJ, TJ deserve it? Yes. But then again, Ray Borg does deserve it. But ultimately, like you said. What's your call? Who do you want, Borg or, or Dillashaw? As a fan, probably TJ. But I would feel bad for Ray Borg getting kind of cut off when he does deserve it. But as a fan, I would have to say. Dan, stop. I would love to say Who do you want to see? TJ, DJ. I understand. Um, 
uh, Mighty Mouse wanting to stick with a flyweight and fighting a, a Ray Borg. I mean, as a fight fan, I'd rather see the bigger name, Dillashaw, and, and if uh, if uh, Mighty Mouse is going to break the record, you kind of want it to be a significant opponent, mm-hmm. you know? You, you'd, um, so I don't know. I mean, part of me, you know, I, I'm, I'm fairly pro fighter. You know, I want to see the guys get what they deserve and stuff. Um, so I kind of feel like, uh, you know, we, we're not privy to the, the, the negotiations for the fight and stuff and, and what he's going to get paid. But I would like to see DJ get a big payday, and I think the potential is there with the Dillashaw fight right. much more than a, a Ray Borg fight. So I don't know. I think it's in everyone's best interest to, you know, to do the Dillashaw fight, assuming the money's right. Right. Uh, but I, I can't fault, you know, Mighty Mouse for his reasoning. You know, he, he's kind of sticking up for his division, which has been pushed around ever since, you know, he got the title. They've kind of been... Uh, you know, cast aside and, and, and crapped on. And right. So I think he's sticking up for the 125-pounders now that there's actually a, a spotlight on the division. As a media member who likes to see a road to the title, I want to see Borg get it. Exactly. Because I feel mm-hmm. like this is a guy fighting at that division. He got some wins. He's got a streak. He should fight the champ if he's the clear number one, which it appears he might be at this point. As a fan, I guess the Dillashaw booking is probably more to my liking because this – could be a huge historical moment and I think it'd be a quality competitor to uh, Demetrius Johnson's resume and I'm also trying to fit into how, what the sports become and that's entertainment with these money fights so I'm trying to look through those blinders as well so it, 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 ma'am just when you start to lean towards that all of a sudden you come back to like hearing you know someone give a pure and organic thought like like Johnson that says, well, no, I, I'm, I actually want to fly away, you know, and, and you start to think, well, well, that's kind of what we all wanted for a long time, but yet we've steered in this certain direction, and now we're maybe coming back. Let me ask you a question. Say uh, scheduling injuries, all that stuff isn't an issue. Like, you could pick any opponent for, you know, uh, Mighty Mouse's potential record-breaking fight. Who would it be at this point right now? Any opponent. Everyone's uh, probably Benavides. I, I was thinking the same thing, yeah. and but then it like, and and it seems counterproductive that the biggest fight you can make is for a guy he already beat. It is, you know. Yeah. So, but that's that's definitely the fight I I want to see, or possibly like Cody coming down, but that's not going to happen, you yeah. know. And do a champ versus champ to break the record. So. It, it's going to boil down to if DJ wants to stick to fighting for his division, it's going to hurt his pocketbook because I guarantee yep. you the Dillashaw fight is a bigger fight. Yeah, and he'll 100%. have to make the decision because I know for a long time he's wanted to make more money, and this is probably where they're going to tell and you. Th- and this could just be posturing to get that money, you know, like he'll, you know, mm-hmm. and, and which I, I wouldn't fault him one bit. It's actually kind of smart of him to play it that way. Yeah. Right. Let's hear from Aaron in Minneapolis. He's got some thoughts on this. What's up, Aaron? How you doing? Hey, what's up, guys? Um, first thing, Ray Borg's got two wins in a row. Okay, and one of them <laughs> I think. <laughs> wait. I mean, let's be real here. The reason why he deserves it is because he wiped out a division. It. Yeah, exactly. I mean, do you want to get paid or do you want to break the record? I mean, you can probably do both with TJ, but it's almost like, okay, yeah, we compare the, the record with Anderson, you know, his title fates. There's also something else to compare. Anderson had to fight a bunch of scrubs because he cleaned out the division too. It reminds me of like when, when they brought in Jeremy Horn to fight Liddell. At some point, do you want to be a big name? Because if he goes and fights TJ, that could set him up for many, many fights to actually be headlining pay-per-views. Right now, he's just stuck on those Fox cards. And I don't know, man. Hopefully, it's just a way for him to say, pay me more money and I'll fight him. But if he really wants to fight Ray Borg, that's the first decision that TJ's or, uh, uh, Johnson's made that I'm kind of like Frank Mirface. Not, and not to mention, Ray Borg has missed Thank weight you, twice Aaron. before. Like, mm-hmm. you really want to build up this record uh, title-breaking, per, you know, fight, and then we finally get there, and then Borg misses weight, and it's a non-title fight, so he can't break – so Mighty Miles can't break the record, you know. That's a good point. Because that's what we feared with Lineker, remember? Right, yeah. Lineker, I think, had a fight that uh, was a number one cont- – I'm going back, like, three years to with Bagu Tinov. Mm-hmm. He won the fight but didn't make weight. And I believe he had about a four-fight win streak, so he was clearly in line to fight DJ. Six. But because six at the time, yeah. But but because that happened, he moved up to to 35 when he clearly could have fought 
Uh, so it's not it's not out of the realm of reasoning that something like that wacky could happen. He yeah. shows up and misses weight. And then the guy doesn't have a – he has to take the fight out of pressure right. from fans and the promotion, and he's not able to break his own record. Yep. Well, that begs the question, can Dillashaw make 25 that easy? And, and that, and, that's and another 10 pounds off the, a pretty fit guy. And, I mean, and that's the best way to market Mighty Mouse, and especially to a more general sports audience, which they try to do, you know, with pay-per-view. You want to get, you know, casual MMA fans, new fans. So, I mean, you, you've got to imagine the whole the, the, the whole marketing campaign for that fight is going to be breaking the record, and then yeah. if you can't deliver that to people buying the pay-per-view at the last minute, it's like, well, you know, I was tuning in to see a guy break a record, and now he, even if he wins, he's not going to break the record. So, yeah, I mean, but like you said, you, you've got that potential for it to go wrong against Borg and Dillashaw because weight has to be a concern, you know, for, for both of them. How about Whitaker and Romero? Uh, yeah, yeah, I got that right. Yeah. Whitaker, uh, for the interim, uh, you guys okay with that? Jason B., you go first. I'm okay with that. I know a lot of people go, interim title? Why? We have so many of them, and they've lost meaning. That is true, and I agree with that in some scenarios. And you know why they have? Because as soon as the fighter wins, he goes, I don't want that trash belt. I want the real belt. Exactly. And I, I feel like some, you know, going back to what Joe Lazan said yesterday, fighters should think a little bit more before they say that. For one, an interim belt still is a world title. You fought for that because the champ wasn't ready to go. And at some point, that's your ticket to the front of the line, and he has to fight you, uh, you know, for, for the, uh, the actual title. You know, the, the, what do they call it when they merge them together? Or unify. 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 They have to yeah. unify it. So you have to do that. <sighs> if Romero were to beat Bisping, his first guy would be Whitaker anyway. Exactly. So, you know, at some point, they had to deal with that. Uh, I realize it kills contenders. I think we usually worry about it more for a dominant champion. No disrespect to Bisping, but I think everyone feels like whoever he fights next, he could possibly lose the title. Whereas with Silva or GSP, we wanted to give them bodies. Come on, you fight them next. Don't eliminate each other and then fight GSP. Everyone fight GSP. Everyone fight Anderson. So with Bisping, it feels like it, any one guy has a shot. I think even odds makers that say have told us anybody that fights Bisping will be a favorite going in. So um, yeah, like of the I'm four or five. Realistic well, Saucy, possibilities. Saucy, Whitaker, probably, he, He's yeah. underdog to all of them. But the thing with this division is now everybody doesn't want to unify um, interim title, rather. But everybody's complaining that the division's being yeah, held yeah, up. No, yeah. So which one do you want? Do you want to see an interim title against two top guys at 185 fighting and battling out for the next shot at Bisping, and then you got two guys going at it, or do you want to hold up the division and then go Romero, then Whitaker? Then you got a crop of guys just sitting there going, well, I want the next shot. It's going to come down to two, two top guys fighting anyways. So whether it's for an interim title or not, this is a good fight, and it's going to advance the vision. Not to mention of all interim titles, like with the way so many fans hate Bisping, like that's the one – I shouldn't say the one time, but there's going to be a lot of fans being like, okay, the interim champ's the real champ anyways. You know, screw Bisping. So, mm. yeah, I, I think that's really – you know, I, for, for Romero and, and Whitaker, that, that's Those a great opportunity. Those guys could market it like that, yeah. right? And, and if they're smart, as soon as they win, they're the ones saying that, you know. And that that builds so much heat for the eventual fight with Bisping that, you know, it, it just it makes perfect sense. And if you're holding a 213 ticket, you're pretty jacked. You lost yeah. Cody versus Dillashaw, but now you get this title fight. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You got to give the UFC credit there. credit for that one. All right, we got to do another break. It's MMA Junkie Radio on Series XM Rush 93. We're talking Dillashaw versus Mighty Mouse. We're talking Whitaker versus Romero. Those fights got uh, made yesterday, although it looks like one of them may be uh, still got to clear some hurdles there. Demetrius Johnson tweeting earlier that uh, no contracts have been signed and he would prefer to fight Ray Borg. We'd like to get your thoughts on that. Again, 866-522-2846 is the number to call in. MMA Junkie Radio on Series 6 7 Rush 93 with Dan Stupp in the house.
Tell your boss to reschedule that meeting. Call your wife and tell her lunch is off. It's time for more MMA Junkie Radio with Gorgeous George and Goes. Man, that's a jam right there. Michael's killing it on the music today, man. I like it. I like it. All right, let me tell you something about Fantasy Sports Radio. Sirius XM has a channel dedicated to fantasy sports 24 hours a day. Whether you play fantasy baseball, daily fantasy sports, or fantasy football, you can hear winning advice and information, plus expert drafts and special events. Listen to former big league general manager Jim Bowden, former MLB all-star Cliff Floyd, and the best fantasy sports analysis in the business, Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio. For people who play fantasy sports, Sirius XM, sorry, Sirius 210 XM 87, or listen on the Sirius XM app. It's a quality app. They did some upgrades over the last few years. Commercial free, HD audio. I love it. And a lot of shows are available, so hit that search button for crying out loud. All right, we are scrambling around here a little bit. Might have a, a couple of uh, extra guests. We'll see what, what we can do. That. And uh, that's the way we roll here at MMA Junkie Radio, especially during fight week. Talking the possibility of Mighty Mouse versus TJ Dillashaw. We're also talking about Whitaker versus Romero. Those fights got made yesterday. I saw them when I was on the field. With a junkie gathering football game versus Extreme Couture, and I had my own my own uh, internal reaction, but uh, just want to see what Junkie Nation thinks about it. We've kind of shared uh, our thoughts over here. The one thing we can say is whether it's Borg or Dillashaw, that's a quality fight yep. to break a record. And like was pointed out by Aaron from in, uh, Minneapolis. Anderson got the record, but there was a couple cupcakes on the schedule. You know, those guys that went down to welterweight, they're guys that really didn't deserve it or weren't, weren't even ready for the show. And the reason is because he cleared the whole division, so it was like, you know. we we I think we also kind of romanticized his, his title period, but there was a big chunk of that where fans really weren't happy with him and felt like he was goofing around in fights and not giving it his all and – and, I mean, what was it, the Abu Dhabi fight? Against uh, Damien Maia. Yeah, yeah. Where, where Dana went off on him afterward. And the whole yeah, – yeah, it sounds familiar now because we've heard it before, but said he he'd, he couldn't trust him to headline, basically, yeah. you know, because uh, if he does that stuff. so. Uh, but I, I think of all the records you can uh, possibly break in the UFC or set in the UFC, can you think of a, a, a more prominent one than that? Like, you could have the most knockouts – but that could be because you're facing lesser competition. You could have the most wins, but that's just because you're around forever. But I, I think that's probably the premier record to break yeah. in, in the UFC. When people look back at the records, you yeah. see most title defenses, Demetrius Johnson. Yeah. Let's talk to Dean in Georgia. He wants to chime in on DJ and TJ. What's up, Dean? How you doing? Gentlemen, how's it going? Dan, welcome to the studio. Thank you, thank you. Um, look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. Uh, I'm excited about that. So I wanted to just touch base. Dan did mention, you know, how can you trust a guy that has missed twice, uh, missed weight twice, and uh, on the one that he he missed weight, he was a couple, he was several pounds over. Yeah. So he's definitely he definitely doesn't have a shot there. I think the um, the it should Dillashaw kind of makes a lot of sense. He has a very Unique style. Well, I'm gonna and think about it potentially, you know. And, and you always gotta think of like, okay, if this guy wins, you know, DJ is gonna get a instant rematch. Say if Dillashaw is DJ's kryptonite and he beats him, how big is it now that fight with him and Gabrett? Two champions, Ooh. same fight camp, went on the tough show. Why didn't we you think know, of that? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, Dean. <laughs> yeah, like I, I wonder if Dana White's going, yeah, fuckers, that's what we're trying to do <laughs> yeah. here. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's an interesting angle. So, again, how does he get these guys to the dance? Just dangle a little extra zero on a paycheck, and, and uh, you're right. Look, And, and it's funny because we're looking at a play where arguably the uh, the pound-for-pound pound number one guy would lose in this play just for what could be a bigger fight. But uh, he'd be going up against the quality opponent. I get that. Uh, great, great point, Dean. That's all I had. Hey, you guys did great yesterday. I saw the video. I can't wait to see everyone tomorrow. 
can't wait to see my family. Talk to you guys later. All right, Have player. A great day. Have a safe flight, all right? Take care. All right. Wow, I'm trying to do some scheduling here, <laughs> last-minute scheduling. Uh, we do have a couple guests coming in, Jamie Moyle, uh, also Eric Spicely. They're going to come to the studio. We'll chat with them. They're boarding on a plane to Brazil. I think later today they'll be fighting at UFC 212. So let me know, by the way, anybody in the New York area where you might be watching UFC 212. I might be out in your neck of the woods. i got to get some more details uh if it's a public setting where i'll be watching but i, th I think i'm gonna be in the big apple for that there one you go. yeah so you i told you about that the other day right danny yeah hopefully if you can get out and uh and i can bring some friends it should be a fun party no uh 866-522-2846 is the number to call in at any time listen our producers will always let you know if there's a guest or if we can't get you on in the next half hour it's a two-hour show so there's these different pockets and honestly there's sometimes where guests lay an egg and they just they're running late, they're running early, they don't show, and that's when we bring you in. So, yeah, you have to have a little bit of patience, but I believe we excel at trying to get you in as quick as possible. And we even carry the guilt feeling, which we shouldn't. But I've seen a, a 20 or 30-minute hold. Well, that's where you get the extended call. So come in with a couple strong points. The last thing I ever want to hear is, oh, man, the last guy stole my thunder. Well, fuck, you know how much dumb shit happens in our sport? There's a lot of things you could talk about in our sport. You could talk about matchups, or you can go back to Magana getting clocked and getting her bi uh, lip busted by by uh, Cyborg. You could talk about Kevin Lee extending his fist and, and hitting Michael Chiesa because he can't take a mama joke. Uh, <laughs> I'm telling you, man, the sport's fun. It's, oh, yeah. it's fun to cover from so many angles, and, of course, there's the X's and O's of Fight Week 2. Do not forget, by the way, we have a writer and a videographer on their way to Sweden. They will be they will be covering the event this weekend, the UFC Sweden show. What is that, guys? Fight Night 111? 109, I think. I think. Uh, 109? Okay, 109. That's the one coming up with Gustafsson and Teixeira. So that's a quality main event a great in a division that definitely needs a little bit of a, a pick-me-up, some spice, if you will. And Speaking a, of that division. Sunday show, don't forget. Yeah, Sunday morning affair. I think uh, I'll, I'll get you the times when we come back. All right, I'll get you the Eastern start time, Pacific start time. But, yeah, I think on our end we get some morning fights that bleed into the afternoon. And on the East Coast, I believe it's an afternoon affair on Sunday of Memorial uh, Day weekend. All right, folks, we are going to pay some bills, run a couple commercials, do a sports update. We'll come back. We'll take some more calls at 866-522-2846. We have our editor-in-chief. Danced up here in the house. We have a bunch of junkies outside. It's the annual junkie gathering. We're having a blast. Today's day two. And lastly, two guests coming your way, Jamie Moyle and Eric Spicely, both fighting at UFC 212. Stay close. We'll be right back.
my story, it's sad but true. It's about a girl that I once knew. She took my love, then ran around with every single guy in town. Guys, just pumping out the tunes, Danny. These are the the '60s. This is, a, this is our decade day. Yeah, but why don't you put out tunes like this? It's all rotation. I told I told him my cheat sheet. He's he's literally cherry picking off my cheat sheet. Uh, where's right the now. proof, huh? Uh, we'll but look I'm at we'll great look. things off that cheat sheet, though. <laughs> that's the key thing. Fair enough. Yeah, that's why I said you're cherry picking off of it. <laughs> right now, we're working on big things. Gigi's outside on the phone. Trying to get some things cooking here, of course, on MMA Junkie Radio. So how are you liking Vegas so far, Danny? I love Vegas. Um, I apologize to everybody in New York, but I might not be coming home. Never? I go, I go, go for broke. That's true. That's true. <laughs> everyone, in, everyone chipped in and got him a ticket to come out, but they didn't get one. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. I was <laughs> supposed to gamble to win a ticket on the way back, and I'm not doing good I at all. I heard Buffalo Blue lost you some money. Well... It's either you could either say that, or you can say I won him a bunch of money. Because <laughs> he did. We sat down. They were trying to explain because I don't gamble because I'm poor. So <laughs> every day is a gamble at that point. <laughs> 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 what can I have for breakfast? <laughs> no. Um, so they're they, they're trying to explain something. They're like, you take twenty dollars, you put it in one of the slot machines, and you bet like the highest, so that if you double, if you win, you like double instantly. And that's like a good thing, apparently. Yeah. I just wanted to press like the, get used to it, get acclimated to it, and they were like, no, no, go for the eight dollar. We put in twenty dollars. I get like three spins, and that's it. So Blue's sitting there waiting, for uh, for me. Basically, we're gonna come back. We were gonna come back and drink. He's just sitting there waiting for me, and he starts hitting it, and he starts getting bonus, 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 and it's just he's up two hundred and like twenty five bucks, and I'm down to i had to cash out at 45 cents man blue hustled you <laughs> I, I hope you realize that he hustled you but i do have to say to his credit he goes i wouldn't have been able to do this without you so you gave me my money back <laughs> never so didn't give you like 20 he just gave me 20 man i don't gamble <laughs> but i saw a guy shooting craps like about a week ago and i guess they were hooting and hollering having a good time and they were tipping this guy like 200 dollars chips or whatever Jeez. it was i'm like how much money did you win and he was talking about like oh that's only 10 percent i'm like damn I don't even wow. have twenty bu- bucks in my pocket right yeah. now. The ATM yeah. is about to charge me seven ninety nine and pull out money. That's crazy. I saw that last night. I was, uh, we were uh, drinking over at another bar with uh, cousin Jeffrey, and he was trying to explain to me uh, roulette, and I don't understand roulette at all. <laughs> He's like, "Yeah, you just pick one number and a color." And I said, "That seems like it's really risky." Yeah. He goes, yeah, but you look like a badass if that number and color comes <laughs> up that one time. He goes, you go up to the table, you go, watch this. And you like, you just pick a number, you put it on. And he goes, I go, but you're going to lose like so many times in a row. He goes, yeah, but that one time you get it. But the one you, time. You just, you get it, you leave. And no one understands what happens. You just blow everybody's mind. But there was a dude at that table that just had the biggest stack of chips I have ever seen. And his strategy was... He would pick like four numbers where he'd put big stacks on, and then he would put little stacks on all these other numbers, and red and black. So no matter what, he won every single time. He was getting pyramids of money every single. He was he would lose a ton, but he won. He, he would win no matter what, while slowly losing. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but he's like winning like I don't know two grand every time. <laughs> uh, I'm just sitting there. I'm like I don't understand. I don't even have that much money in my bank account, let alone. One <laughs> one roulette spin winning that much. Well, sometimes, yeah. like, when you buy in, those chips could be worth, like, 25 cents each. They were, I yeah. think they were either $5 or $1. Because he had, like, a bunch of different color chips. Well, that's the thing. Each player gets a different color mm-hmm. so oh. that you can track individual okay. bets. So, hell, they could have been nickel bets out there for all you know. And you're like, man, look at that high roller like, over there. Yeah, look at him. <laughs> He's throwing those out like crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of talk about 213. Of course, Demetrius Johnson and TJ Dillashaw are in talks about a potential fight. 
but like we were explaining before earlier in the hour, DJ was quick to shut that down. He would rather have a fight with Ray Borg. But like Dan was saying, that could just be a potential to say, you know what, I'll fight Ray Borg. And then UFC goes, no, nah, man, let's let's make this TJ fight. Here's Cha-ching. a little paycheck. <laughs> and then DJ goes, okay, I just hustled you. Do you think that's the game plan that he's going for maybe? I, I, it wouldn't be a bad game plan. No, and, no. and I know he feels like he's not getting paid what he's worth, and it's hard to, to disagree with him. I know a big part of it is, you know, if you draw pay-per-view eyeballs, you're going to get paid well. But I think there also has to be uh, an understanding in this sport that if you're the greatest fighter in the sport and going after the hardest record to break, uh, whether you draw you know the the casual fans in or not, you deserve a pretty big paycheck for that. Yeah, so. I agree. And like Dean was saying on the phone, imagine if TJ won and went up and fought Cody. Now here's the other way: if DJ ends up winning that fight, if they do fight. You can promo that as the greatest champion ever going up to become only the third man to hold two titles and the second man to hold two titles simultaneously. And, so and that's a big promo as well. And, and I think he'd be open to it at that point. Like mm-hmm. He's always said, I, I want to get the record and then maybe you know can consider 135. And if you're going to – I that that's super fight potential right oh, there. Oh, God. You know? Man. The juices are flowing. Now I'm hyped up for this TJ <laughs> DJ fight, man. Yeah. Let's make this happen. Yeah. Uh, I. What can I tell you, man? I'd love to see it happen. And we're trying to, you know, talk to some of these players, but some of these players just uh, respectfully decline to talk right now. Mm-hmm. Holding so. their cards close to their chest. Right. Yeah. And uh, honestly, some of that uh, makes sense, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I said this two weeks ago. It's funny because when situations come up, you go, I wonder if the fighter's right or I wonder if the UFC's right. They're both right because they both have certain angles that when they're carefully explained to you, you realize, wow, they both have strong points. It's just that the promotion's strong points just might not mesh with what the other guy was thinking and then the other guy's what he's thinking may not mesh with what the promotion's thinking. And so that's why it takes a huddling. But there are going to be these games, air quotes, you know, these games that get uh, played. And some of them are really, really good chess moves. And some of them are as simple as, like, well, fuck the UFC. Like, Al Guy yeah. Quinta, you know, <laughs> well, fuck the UFC then or whatever. And some of those work, too. So, again, it's 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 quite a sport, man. It's 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 quite a sport that we have here, and you just don't know what to expect from anyone at any time. No, not at all. Yeah. yeah I, I, as editor of MMA Junkie, and a guy who's been covering the sport for a while, the, the business and promotional side of, of covering the sport is one of the, the, mo- the, the best parts of the job and the most fun, you know. Like, the fighting's great and, and seeing the fights and stuff. But the way this business works is, you know, quite a bit different than, than some of your other major pro sports. So Yeah, for sure, man. All right, let's talk to Chris from Fresno. He wants to chime in on Romero versus Whitaker. Again, if you want to chime in, 866-522-2846. Romero, Whitaker, DJ, TJ, Ray Borg, that little triangle. If you want to bring that up, that's cool, too. And, of course, there's Tishara. And Gustafson out in Sweden on Sunday. I did say Sunday. Chris from Fresno, what's up, man? What's good? How you guys doing? Man, we're all right. How come you're not here at the Junkie Gathering? <laughs> you know, I'm po. Nah, you know, I just I can't get away from work. I probably could have went a few days, but you know how it is. Um, how's the, the gathering going so far? Well, day one was a blast. We played extreme couture and flag football, and even though we lost, we represented. Yeah, What's on your mind, um, brother? Okay, Romero so Whitaker, you like it? I'm pretty. Uh, I'm pretty. Yeah, man. I'm pretty. I'm pretty uh, juiced about that fight. Um, you know, I think it's gonna go the same exact way as Whitaker and Jacare. You know, I've been I've been on uh, Whitaker's uh, bandwagon for years now. Um, same thing. He's gonna he's gonna stuff all of Romero's uh, shots. I mean, I, I've talked about him on the show before, and. Everyone knows Whitaker's got some phenomenal takedown defense. As far as the striking goes, you all can hit hard, but he's not as clean as Whitaker. Whitaker's going to take him apart in the first. He's going to decapitate him, and he's going to get the next title shot. Well, I guess it's for interim title, but uh, he's going to be the, the middleweight champion. He's going to be there for a while. Um, that being said, uh, I'm out. You guys just have a good one. All right, Chris, thank you. Bold prediction. It is. I like it. Took a stance. He it. ran with it. The one thing I'll respectfully disagree is – even though Whitaker has great takedown defense, and sometimes there's underhooks, a sprawl, as was pointed out by Dan Tom on the show. He has really good wrist control, mm-hmm. all right? However, we're talking about an Olympic silver medalist freestyle wrestler, you know? So that's, 
It's a step up from some of the other guys that have tried to take him down. This is a guy who's been doing it all all his lives. All the fibers in his muscle know how to react and explode on a double or whatever needs to happen. So it may be tougher than usual, but, uh, you know, it, it's going to be a great fight. I'm just, I'm jacked. It's and then jacked that it's going to happen in, let me see, what is it, like July 8th or something? Yep. And this is May 24th, so six weeks away. You know, there's been times, I remember when they said, McGregor and Aldo, they're fighting in July, and they were running around in a jet, like in February, and I couldn't wait. And I would, you know, I'd see these, this 10-day tour, and I was like, yeah, that's cool. They're shoving each other, they're lipping off, but we still got to wait three more months, and then eventually one of the parties got injured, and we never got it until six months after that. And here we are, six months, six weeks away, and just like snap of a finger, we're getting a great quality flight, uh, fight. I hope you didn't just jinx us. Uh, I don't think so. No, no, I no. Just, I have a theory. What's that? Of man, if All I right. would have said something like, "Man, I just hope one of those guys doesn't get," you know, I think that's sure. more down the jinxing route. But I'm just excited at the matchup. Yeah, because we've had a bad string of last-minute pullouts. So I just hope 213 is such a great card, top to bottom. I just pray, pray that nothing bad happens. Yeah. And by the way, this proposed August show, would that fill in the blanks on a UFC 215? Because UFC 216 was announced in Edmonton, I believe. Yep. And that's uh, September 9th again, I believe. But I, I'm pretty sure I'm accurate there. Mm -hmm. And there was a 214 on July 29th in Anaheim, California. That's the DC and John Jones and possible Cyborg uh, versus Megan Anderson. But I kept asking to my, I kept wondering and asking goes, well, what happened to UFC 215? That's bizarre that. They're already planning one show ahead. Do uh, you guys have any update on that, or, or could this be what they were trying to make here? I, I guess they, it could be. I don't I don't have any information. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any proposed cities? Have you heard anything? Well, I know TJ sent out a tweet with a poll on it saying, who do you want me to? Who do you want DJ to fight, me or Ray Borg? Yeah. Do you want me to headline, me and DJ to headline Was in Was there a follow-up on the poll? He said, um, I didn't see it right. because of, I'm on Goza's account. I didn't want to vote for him. Mm -hmm. But TJ did say – Hey, headline in Seattle, where DJ's from. So that could be something, which I like, because I'm only two hours away from that. Right. <laughs> well. So make it happen. Yeah. That is his hometown. That would be huge. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Man, I don't know what they're going to decide there. All right. It's going to be interesting. Yeah. Let's turn the page, at least get this out of the way. I don't know how many shows we'll, ha we'll be able to do this, because there's more junkies, more non-MMA stuff that we may be talking later in the week. But give me your final prediction for Gustafson and uh, Teixeira couple light heavyweights who have had their their runs and then they come up just short either in a title fight or these key contender fights and they just keep recycling back because it's not a deep division. Tell me what you think of, the, of that fight. I think Teixeira, and he's, he even said it himself. He's the he, underdog. He even said it his last fight. Man, I didn't feel good. I didn't feel like this was my best performance. And if I want to keep at a level of the John Jones, the DCs, the Rumbles, I'm going to have to step my game up. It's a big challenge in Gustafson because that's a guy who took Jones to the brink and put on a hard fight with DC. So he's fought the upper echelon of the 205 division. Will Teixeira be able to compete with that? He's got power. So any fight he's in, he's in the fight because no matter if it's the fifth round or the first round, he can knock him out. If I had to make a prediction, I would say Gustafson's the more, more polished fighter at this time. So I would have to go with him. But, man, I can't wait for this fight. It can go any direction, in my opinion. Dan Stuff, who do you like in that fight? We actually had to turn in our, our staff picks uh, uh, today, you know, which we'll run on the website on, on Friday. And Gustafson's, a, I think, more than a, a three-to-one favorite, and I understand the rationale why. I, I get it. But I still don't you know. do three to one between those two. Ma like, is he that much better? Or is it? W with, he's in Sweden. With that said, though, I, I actually I'm picking Teixeira. Yeah. You know, even without the odds, just straight up. And I wish I had a, a really good reason for it, and and could give you you know the the key to the victory. But that fight ending. You know, we've seen Gustafson look up, upset pick. You know. Well, one of them might have even been a six and zero night. Warm sharing a blanket. Uh, I'm due to get hot at one I, of these I get, I get what you We'll compete much like the Strawweights did a few years ago with the finale being the actual title fight. So a champion comes out of the ultimate fighter. Do you like that? Do you like it that way? Or do you wish they would introduce a division much like they did featherweight or bantamweight? Well, in bantamweight, they actually said, you're the champ. 
Ronda Rousey, here you go. Walk out there, do this press conference. Here's here's your belt. With featherweight, they said you two fight. They weren't really featherweights, but they said you two fight, build it, and they will come. So, what do you guys prefer? I'll tell you what I prefer, and I don't know why the UFC hasn't done it more often. Remember when they kicked off the flyweights and you had the four-man tournament? That was cool. I love that because the tough thing with tough, the tough thing with tough, um, is that you've got 16 people you're trying to market. When you do the four-man tournament, everyone gets enough attention. You, you get excited about two fights and then the big payoff. Like, you're, you're really building towards something. I think with the Ultimate Fighter, it's just too many people to give enough attention to any one of them to really build them up. Like, I wish they did try to find the four best or, or you know, let the matchmakers determine who they think the f- best four are. Put them in a tournament on pay-per-view or a big fight. While con- creating contenders, Wait, I do, like it. Do the outside four go into the house? No. no. Okay, so they just nothing to do with it at a house yeah. at all. You're, so you're, you're basically and, – and, you know, even if you lose the tournament, just like we saw with, you know, Benavidez and, and, and you know – they're still top guys, even if they lose in the McCall. You know, they're still top guys. But you're real that you, that way. You're really building the division. All the other contenders and, and the ones who rise to the top are now a contender. And and you've got your kind of middle of the the, mm. the division ones who you know maybe get knocked down the semifinals or quarterfinals. But I, I just I, you feel like and I think we saw that when they did it with the strawweight season. You know, when Asparza came out and Rose like. It's like, unless you were really in tune to, to tough, and not many people watch it these days, um, it was like, okay, so who's fighting for the title? You know? Yeah. And, and I think if you, if you do it on Fox or pay-per-view and do the little mini tournament that way, your big names in the division get much more of a spotlight, and, and it's easier to get excited about the division that way. And then use tough to build out the rest of the division. I like tough, and I like that season, but here's what I think I'm realizing. It was fresh. And because someone mm-hmm. who likes – wanted tough to survive i thought well that's an interesting idea and so they satisfied that but you're right you brought up the flyweight division from a few years ago that was pretty cool that they had a little four-man semi-final mm-hmm. uh so i think and we got excited and, about those here's fights. another thing about the straw weights i remember felice or one of the young ladies said the these are the best 16 in the world and we're all competing and i get it she felt proud about that group but in reality looking back carolina kovakavich wasn't in the house mm-hmm. Joanna andrechik was in the house Claudia Gadelia was not in the house. Paige wanted to be in the house, and so she wasn't 21. But there was a few others that have risen to the top that are pretty damn good. Uh, Jessica Aguilar was with World Series of Fighting that uh, weren't necessarily there, and yet it you know it produced a champ, but and it, they it, didn't and have it the a, best. It puts a chip on their shoulder too. Like you know what, I should have been in the four man or the four woman tournament. Like I shouldn't have to go through tough. So I'm going to go on tough and dominate them, get my title shot, and prove it. You know. Is so. there any chance you could uh, match make for the UFC if things don't work out with USA Today Sports and MMA? I mean, you have some like really good ideas over there. It seems there. like a really stress-free job, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think yeah, I've talked to Joe Silva a few times, and and I realize I I don't want his job at all because yeah, if all you had to do was sit in a room and pick, I want this person to fight this person, not not have to deal with the negotiations and the scheduling and the injuries, but. No, I, I, you know. Rumor has it he cashed a big check, though. Good. Good for him. He yeah. deserved it. Mm. And, and $40 billion. There's a fraction out there. I think it's one thousandth or something like that. There's a rumor floating around that there's a big check with a four and a bunch of zeros for his work, uh, you know, the 20-year the term that he had. You plus, sure you don't want to reconsider? Plus a Hall of Fame induction. Plus yeah. a Hall of Fame induction. No. I, uh, upsize I, that boat a little? I, I think. I think a lot of people have good ideas. I, I think it, it's easy for us, you know, knuckleheads like me, to, to come up with ideas when you don't have to worry about the logistics and, and putting it together and stuff. So I think the UFC gets some crap sometimes because we want them to do stuff that just logistically probably isn't possible. But I, I, I like that idea. For I, I got to admit, I like my own idea <laughs> for, for how to handle that. This flyways. guy goes on Facebook, <laughs> puts a post, and likes it. No. Who does? No, I'm just up. saying. <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, Marco from Waco. What's up, man? Hey. Marco from Waco. <laughs> what's up? Que pasa, dude? And then it's up. <laughs> hey, how you doing, guys? Good. How you doing? Hey, hey, hey Yeah, yeah. Yeah, hey. So, uh, on this idea of uh, the, the, the tournament, man, I will agree to do a tournament with four names. If the four names that we get to the tournament was people that we recognize, that is the problem with the freaking uh, uh, f- uh, flyweight division. Like uh, it, the consensus would be that Joanna and Jake should actually be on that tournament, the, the four women tournament. 
and she wouldn't freaking take a fight unless it was for an immediate title shot, you know? Uh, so that is why probably the top format makes more sense because you're introducing a whole new division at this point. And I'm actually excited for this whole new division. You're going to bring a lot of people for Invicta that we cannot sort of recognize, like Roxanne Mara Ferry and uh, other people like that. But uh, a lot of the casuals don't really know who the fuck these people are. So, you know, it makes it makes a little bit more sense for me to do the tough, to just introduce a champion and then let Joanna school that champion and become a two-way champion. That is just my take on that. Be better leave your eyes, can you guys next time. See you, Marco. I, I think you bring Joanna in to keep momentum for the division. I think you, like, I, if it were me, I would do the four-woman tournament, let those four big names, you know, get some spotlight, get introduced, have tough, you know, take some of the mid-level ones or, or the ones that were close to the four and introduce them. You do a couple title fights, you know, tough determines a, a number one contender. They fight whoever the champ is. Then bring Joanna in for the super fight to further build the division. So I, I don't, I wouldn't throw Joanna in that mix. And, and she's got stuff to do at Strawweight anyway. So Well, he did say, who are the four flyweights that we would do? I have an idea. There's already four Bantamweights that have said they'd go down. Uh, Juliana Pena, Alexis Davis, Sarah... Sorry, the Marine. What's her name again? Liz Carmouche and Valentina Shoshenko. Mm -hmm. Valentina's got this fight coming up, so if she were to lose, then perhaps that's your quartet. Then you build the other flyweights, like Dan said, put them on that card, subsequent cards, whatever, mm -hmm. and let Joanna break Ronda's record because I think she wants to do yeah. that yep. and then compete. So they could play it out that way. Now it looks like they've probably already thought of all these options and they're just going to build it as they come. But, yeah, that, that – there is a difference between the strawweights who are very recognizable, a lot of those young ladies, and these flyweights. I've yet to get the names, but I don't know that that's just the division that's popped over the years. I mean, there's a few over at Invicta, but for the most part, like, eh. You but, know, like, but when they did that with the flyweights, like, were we all like, oh. Strawweights, you mean? Or, no, with the male flyweights when they did uh -huh. the four-man tournament. Well, it, was, it wasn't a bad quartet. The only one we didn't recognize was the Shudo champion. I think his name was Darren Uenama yeah. or something like that. Right. Um, but, like, we had, like, we didn't know. Uh, McCall or um, uh, Demetrius was going to be what he was. It's not like we're right. like, like, oh, these are the four best by far. It's like, they were okay, just small band we weights at the time they dropped. And, yeah. yeah. But it, those women would have much bigger names than I think the guys did back then, which, which I think would make it even more prominent, you know, like some of the names you mentioned, Carmouche. And Let's take this break, get it out of the way. we got a couple fighters coming to the studio, Jamie Moyle and Eric Spicely. They'll both be fighting at UFC 212, Hald uh, Aldo. <laughs> Aldo versus Holloway, and that's on June 3rd at the Junesse Arena in Rio de Janeiro. Eric Spicy will be battling Shoe Face, a.k.a. Antonio Carlos Jr. Jamie Moyle will be fighting Vivian Pereira on the prelims. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Sirius XM Rush 93. We'll be right back after this break. Dan Stepp in the house.
They pat down TSA agents because they don't know where those people have been and because they can. They are gorgeous George and Goes. And this is MMA Chunky Radio. All right, we're joined by Eric Spicely here in the studio, UFC middleweight. He's going to be traveling down to Brazil, Rio de Janeiro to be more exact, as he'll battle Shoeface Antonio Carlos Jr. So that, that's, that's the way you can start the war words by going, what's up, Shoeface? <laughs> Cara de Sapato. Cara de Sapato. Yeah, yeah. He, he said you like knew nice Portuguese. That's Portuguese you're speaking, brother. I knew a little bit of Portuguese. No? Yeah. Anything? Uh, and like, uh, here, uh, uh, onde está no banedo? That just means where's the restroom? No, I don't know, know what that means. And if somebody s- talks Portuguese. Uh, Claudia on the Ultimate Fighter, they helped us a lot. I've been working on my striking for a very long time, and no one ever really gets to see it, so I think nobody really thinks I can strike at all. So it'll be interesting um, in this fight because I think uh, I don't think his wrestling's – very good. Mm-hmm. I think he's got jujitsu guy wrestling, you know, big overhand right to the single or double leg and kind of muscles you. Mm-hmm. And I've uh, been working with Andrew Sanchez for a very long time, the guy that I fought in the Ultimate Fighter, who's right. now a close personal friend. And I think he has some of the best wrestling in the division. Um, and yeah, I think it's going to be a great fight. I'll be able to stop his takedowns and beat him up on the feet. Yeah. And by the way, he, he also expends a lot of energy, and, like, you know how he's a – okay, so he's a great fighter. You're all great fighters yeah. to be at that level. But I noticed that whether it's damage or maybe just seven and a half to ten minutes of action, and that gas tank depletes a lot faster than most middleweights. He's a big guy. I mean, he won the Ultimate Fighter at heavyweight, and then he dropped to 205, and then he dropped to 85. You know, he's a really – probably on the bigger end of the spectrum of uh, middleweights – and I'm not a big middleweight. I'm usually on weight. I'm, you know, around 15 to 13 pounds over just when I'm training, you know what I mean? So I'm not cutting a lot, and I feel like that's going to be big for this fight because I'll have the gas to go all three rounds and, and be okay, whereas I feel like he's kind of a first-round guy, and if he can't get you in the first round, he, he has a tough time, especially with guys that can stop his takedowns. And like Dan Kelly was able to stop his takedowns, and he ended up, just gassing out for sure santos is a name alvi's a name uh shoe face is a name so i we're talking about this progression as you're going upward how exciting is it to be a part of this 185 division that actually may be one of the most competitive right now where for a long time it was dominated by arguably the greatest of all time in anderson silva yeah um it's actually really exciting it's a good time especially for me like i said i'm on a, a two-fight win streak and uh I feel like the top 15 is kind of wide open. Guys are retiring. They're kind of, you know, Tim Bosch, I think, just lost, and he was number 15, and Sam was in there, and he just lost. So, you know, a couple of quality wins you can get into the top 15. And, you know, I already have a win over who Tiago Santos, who was number 15, so that kind of puts me, like, right on the cusp. So I think a couple more big wins, you know, I'm kind of in the picture to, to make a run at, at the title. Yeah, Weidman, Rockhold, Whitaker, Bisping. I mean, there's a lot of quality names. It's yeah. a great division, and I'm glad that they made a move. You saw the interim title mm-hmm. up for grabs while the other champion recovers. Mm-hmm. We don't have the circus fight. Sorry, no offense to GSP, but <laughs> he's just not a middleweight. Yeah. You know, you George is a there, good friend of mine. He is a good friend yeah. of yours, but he's not the number one he's, contender. Yeah. I, I get that he's great. If he walked into Walter Wade and says, I want a shot, I'd go, that's you, dog. Yeah. You know what I mean? But middleweight, I, I, I didn't understand that. I wasn't yeah. in favor of it. Well, especially because even if he won, I don't think he'd stay there. Yeah. So it's like, what do you, you know, yeah. it's it's kind of just about money, um, really. But This is our intern, Jason B. <coughs> he's going to ask you some questions. Don't make it easy for him. This is He's doing his final test right now. He's been with us oh, for four perfect. weeks. So this is kind of like a, a final for him. Do not make it easy for him. I like to troll people, so hopefully – Damn, I hate being trolled. This is your second fight in Brazil coming up. Yes. I've always wondered, walking out there, going into Brazil, we always have this theory kind of, wow, you're fighting in Brazil. The crowd's going to be on you. You know, they're going to be chanting at you. Ooh, vamos. Exactly. Are you one of those guys that's like, man, I'm in enemy territory. Let's go. Or are you like, I don't care if we fight in America. I don't care if we fight in Brazil. Do you kind of use that crowd chanting and that animosity for your advantage, or do you not really give a shit about it? Um, so I used to do a lot of pro wrestling. Um, uh, I used to wrestle a lot with Chuck O'Neill, who was in the UFC, yeah. and Matt Riddle. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm very into that kind of playing the heel role and, and kind of taking that all in. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so when I came out there, like, I kept being like, oh, I can't hear you guys. And they were getting even more mad. And even at weigh-ins, they were, 
you know, somebody was trying to jump over the guardrail because I kept being like, you know, like I couldn't hear him. For or real? Something. Yo, it was intense. Damn. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, man, I was just kidding. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> but, yeah, I, I feed off that. And, um, you know, I've had a friend who I think he made his debut down there, and he was like, man, that was the scariest. That really threw him off, you know. And um, for me, it, it's not, it doesn't bother me. It really um, makes I, me motivated. I got you. Do you remember when Kevin Lee flipped off the crowd? Mm-hmm. That disqualified him from the bonuses. And you came back with a bonus last time from yeah. Brazil. So we don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah. But I told him, I go, I think this is the move. No middle fingers, but when you're standing on the scale or when you have a moment, just do this. Flick him some sweat off your forehead. <laughs> just some old pro wrestling tactics. Yeah. Pro wrestling. You feel <laughs> me on that, right? I did the, uh, just do the that. Hulk just Hogan. I did if the. If you want to do the year, that's fine. <laughs> and then when they're bringing it, just go, ah, you know what? Here's a little bit of sweat on you. I love that's go. that's a good one. Yeah. I, I and if the, Reebok has an American flag, like, if Reebok has an American flag and you don't want to hold it up, just wear it as a bandana or something. <laughs> I was thinking about actually coming out like Hacksaw Jim Duggan. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking uh, two about two by four. Yep, the wow. two by four and the American flag, and then cutting my shorts to make look like wrestling trunks, and then painting them blue because you have to wear what they tell you to wear. Yeah. But as long as I paint them blue and don't cover up the logos, I think it'll be okay. And uh, they might get a little too intense for the, the American flag and the, the two by four and then a couple thumbs up. He's the top heel in the game right now. Yeah, he's, he knows what's up. You got to play your part, you know what I mean? So you win this fight, let's say. You come out, you, go, you get the mic. Are you saying, man, all this talk about 185, my name should be in there? Are you just type the guy that be like, man, I'm just going to let the UFC give me fights and I'm going to keep on beating asses till they can't ignore me? No. Uh, I'm definitely going to, you know, even in my last fight, I called out Dan Kelly because you got to create business. You good, know what I mean? Good. You got to, uh, just like pro wrestling, you have to, nobody cares. That there's 500 guys on the roster. And, you know, if you're just one of 500 that, you know, every, there's going to be so many fights and you got to give people a reason to watch. And, you know, I don't have a personal problem with Dan Kelly, but that's a guy I want to fight. You know what I mean? I, I don't like his face. I think he fights and it's sloppy and it's ugly. And so say that, you know what I mean? Make people interested. And a lot of people will afterwards are like, well, I do kind of want to see that fight. Uh, that would be a good fight. You know what I mean? And, and uh, I, have some, I have something planned for a post fight that's going to be really good. This guy nice. gets it, man. He's a go-getter, GG. He's, He's a go-getter. Is. You know, we could end the interview right now. Guys, get out of here. Go win the <laughs> fight. You, you <laughs> get it. You're getting the sport. Yeah. Did you learn a lot from the retreat? I did. Yeah. Yeah. It was good. You have notes? I don't or have you notes. Just nodding your head. I'm a good. Going, okay. I, I have a, a good memory. Joe Lazan took notes. He's got pages of them. Even the world champ, Tyron Woodley, did. So yeah. I was part of those guys. But yeah, as long as you soak something up, that's great. Yeah, a lot of it was really good. Um, some of the stuff was a little. Eh, some yeah. of the like Budweiser guy talking to us and stuff like that. But it was I, for the most part, it was good. Were you mean mugging other middleweights? No, I'm not like that. No? I don't care. Okay. You know, um, no shoulder shrugs or none. It's actually funny because there's a guy in the middleweight division who has been talking a lot of shit to me. Who's that? Uh, Marvin Vittori. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the Huntington Beach, the Italian kid? Yeah. Okay. Because I beat Alessio, his t uh, teammate or friend from back home. Mm -hmm. and, and five minutes after the fight, he just started writing me on Twitter, calling me names, you know, begging to fight me. And, Sorry. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and we had a little back and forth. And, I act and they were on their porch playing beer pong as most frat boys do right on a weekend yeah. or a weekday, whatever. <laughs> With their sweaters around their neck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they thought we threw the bottle at them. Okay. So the guy jumps over the, the railing and then actually starts to call me racial slurs. Straight up? Yeah. Damn. And he said, uh, I'm not going to let an N-word uh, mess up my scholarship or something like that. And, um, and he kept saying this very loudly. Um, so we ended up fighting and my, I had a, a convertible at the time. I'm a big fan of old Volkswagen convertibles. So, you know, him, all his friends started running over and my other friend, it was just me and my friend. So he grabbed a screwdriver out of my back seat oh, shit. and was just like, back up, you know, and everybody like just didn't want to get involved because he's crazy. And uh, so I beat this kid up and then it was very funny. This um, African-American woman came by and while he was on the ground and started hitting him with her purse. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and then we get in the car because we we're just trying to get out of there. And we're, as soon as we're pulling out, the cops pull in and we just kind of. Went right by him and left. Beautiful exit. Yeah. There you Very go. casual. Hey, you know what? You got to be accountable for your words, right? That yeah. kind of happened the other day at the retreat. We were talking about that. That's a whole other story. But that, that's a great story. Thanks for sharing that and one. Then I waited for well, it was a, part a two. few hours. We hung out. We went and we stood on this roof. There was a low roof that you could hang out on. And we watched them. And so they all went in the house. And then we um, got these cinder blocks and threw them through their window. And then we, <laughs> then we got in the car and left town, <laughs> headed to Damn, New York. Damn, don't mess with Eric Spicely. <laughs> wow, he, he, he comes back for more. Yeah, yeah. Great story. It was a great time.
Thanks for joining us here on I the show. I don't condone violence, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible. We get it. <laughs> well, but that, that opening move by the other gentleman was on call for it. Yeah, it was a rough time. All right. Uh, again, safe travels to Brazil. I hope you have a great fight against Shoeface at UFC 212. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. All it was right. very good to meet you. We, you too, sir. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk to Jamie Moyle, UFC Strawway. She's also fighting on the same card versus Vivian Pereira out in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Sirius XM Rush 93. Eric Spicely, Dan up in the house. We'll be right back. They are the Wright Brothers of Mixed Martial Arts. They are gorgeous George and Goes. And this is MMA Junkie Radio. Tell your friends and family about SiriusXM's free listening preview that starts tomorrow and runs through May 30th. They'll hear 100 channels of commercial free music plus sports, news, talk, and entertainment, including uh, the all-new Beatles channel. Tell everyone you know to press the SAT button, the SAT button, if you will, on the radio to enjoy this special listening event. With a complete channel listing and special subscription offers, they can visit SiriusXM.com slash free listen. We are now joined by UFC strawweight Jamie Moyle here in studio. She's also fighting at UFC 212 versus Vivian Pereira down in Rio de Janeiro. Welcome, Jamie. How you doing? Hi, I'm doing great. How are you? Awesome, man. Thank Awesome, young lady. <laughs> I get so used to talking to the guys. Awesome, dude. Awesome, dog. Uh, <laughs> thanks for coming to the studio. We appreciate it. Uh, I, you know, I guess all the hard work's done, a little bit of media, and you hop on a plane, you're out of here. That's right. A couple more days and uh, just a little bit of packing and all that, and I'm ready to go. Some fighters like to train, and they hate doing the media. They just want to get to the fight. Others, you know, uh, actually enjoy the media. Like Eric knocked one out of the park. I thought he did really well. Where do you sit with all this? Do you just wish you could just get to the fight, or do you like talking to us buffoons over here? Uh, it's a little bit of both. Sometimes when I feel like I'm coming to these things, I'm like, oh, man, I'd rather be training. But then when I get here and I meet all you guys and everybody that runs these things, it's it's always so cool to meet everybody. And, you know, everybody's so 
nice and, and it's it's always a good experience. Do you feel like we talk too much X's and O's, like Vivian Pereira, game plans, this and that? Do you wish people would ask you more about like you so that people could get to know you or do you like talking tactics and fighting? Um I mean obviously I have a fight coming up so it's it's good to talk about those things and I think the personality and the other things kinda just fill fill their way in um, as as we speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh you caught that. Yeah you can raise the mic <laughs> just a little bit more. Boom. There you go. All, All right. right. Uh, Vivian Pereira uh, undefeated is that little zero kind of like a target red white red white all the way to the middle <laughs> um somebody asked me that yesterday too uh i mean not really i think it's a it's a great opportunity it looks good for me to beat somebody who's undefeated so um i'm looking forward to i guess rising to that challenge um but f but i'm just looking to get my record up a little bit not really to knock hers down you know so i'm just looking to get mine to five and one so. has john wood at syndicate been turning on the speakers playing Ooh, vamos head. Ooh, vamos head. Because you're going to hear it at the weigh You're going to hear it at the walkout. You're going to hear it during the fight. And there's got to be some sort of, like, you got to have a, a comfort in all that, you know? Um, I mean, it's not going to bother me, you know? Uh, when I was on the Ultimate Fighter, there was a lot of Brazilians around, and they yelled it every single time we had a fight on the Ultimate Fighter. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I know – that they're going to chant and do these things, but um, I heard the Brazilian fans are actually, um, they're very loyal and they really yeah. love the fighters. So after the fight, you know, I think that they're the first ones to shake your hand and high five. And yeah, so I, I think we'll be able to connect even though I'm going to be maybe chanted at in the beginning. <laughs> Jason B., what do you have for Jamie Moyle? You're on the Ultimate Fighter w uh, with Team Ioana. Seeing the champion and doing what she's doing, does that motivate you in any way into saying, I was in the gym working every day with the upper echelon of my division what do you take away from being in that experience um i just i take away i got to see how you want to train every day and her work ethic and uh, her focus during training so it kind of prepared me to see what i'm going to be doing when i take it to the next level which is now you know in the ufc and everything um and yeah i got to train with the best of the best so it gives me confidence to know that you know i could hang with joan i can i can hang with anybody i think she had her eye on her when she was in that gym saying, eh, one day we're going to be fighting. Ever? I mean, if she has the belt and it's my time, then, you know, maybe. All comers. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> what feels better, choking someone or knocking someone out? I've never knocked somebody out. Well, I mean, I'm talking about practices <laughs> or whatever, you know. Um, you know, when you get your hand and you sink your arm under somebody's chin and you know it's in, that's, that's a pretty great feeling. Mm-hmm. Because the knockout, you can always go, oh, I moved my head, footwork, they got lucky, lucky punch. You hear that all the time. There's no lucky around the choke, you know, because there's, like, a sequence of events leading up to that, and then eventually someone is basically saying, all right, you got me, uncle. Right? It's it's either you tap or you go to sleep. <laughs> you have a favorite submission? Um, I do a lot of rear naked chokes, but I do a lot of jiu-jitsu, so I'm, I like to get creative and do all kinds of different submissions mix it up you know mm -hmm. you know how they say Damian Maya is the best at grappling in his division and Edson Barbosa has the leg kicks Wh what about Jamie Moyles there's something that you feel like you're very exceptional at compared to all the other strawweights that's a good question <laughs> being humble <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah <laughs> no um. well let me give an answer I think you're tough man I think you're tough as nails and there's a lot of people that will break when they get punched or things aren't going their way. And I've noticed there's no stopping you. Yeah, I'm, I'm always moving forward. I'm always aggressive, and I'm always putting the pressure on. So I think my pace, my cardio, um, my will to just always be in the fight no matter, no matter what's going on is, is definitely um, one of my biggest assets. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jamie, we're going to close with this. Just like I asked Eric Spicely, just like I ask every in-studio guest, can you share a good street fight story with us? Okay, I only have uh, one really good one, right. but uh, I used to think I was a little tough girl, a little badass. And Set uh, it up. How old were you? I was like in ninth grade. Perfect. I love the <laughs> high school fights. <laughs> and there was this girl who was just a big bully, and uh, one day she was talking shit, and I got out the car, and she... You drove at nine, in ninth grade? No, I was in the back seat, oh, actually. Okay. Yeah, right. so I got out the car, and... Um, I don't know. There was so much adrenaline. I just remember, like, shoving her, and she's all of a sudden falling into the car, and she's, like, punching me backwards, and I'm pushing her. Wait, falling into the car? Was it convertible, or you actually shoved like, her in the window? Like, the door was open. Oh, I see. Because I had gotten out, and then all of a sudden, she was just on me. 
So we were just scrapping, and then I walked away. My friends broke it up, and I had these giant hoop earrings on that I used to wear, and I was they were, like, flying everywhere, and I was like, pick up my fucking earring. And <laughs> it was just <laughs> – it was there was just so much adrenaline and everything going on. So that was pretty much my one. Did she pick them up? Uh, I was kind of yelling at my friend just because – Oh, I, I thought cheating. you were yelling at the girl you beat yeah, up. Yeah, I don't know. It was, it was really stupid. So you won the fight, though, right? Sounds like it. I don't think so. I don't even think I punched her in the face. I think I got was punched. Was it no contest <laughs> uh, or a draw or what? I would say I would say draw, yeah. Nice. Well, you <laughs> stuck up for yourself. Bullying sucks, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I hope more fighters, if they ever get a chance. Um, I, I think Reed Harris is one of the guys that's in charge of, like, community relations. I would love it if all 500 fighters could go to a school or two, you know, uh, one day out of the year, a couple days out of the year, and talk about that because, God, I see it on Facebook, kids getting bullied, they don't know. And if, if they can hear it from professional fighters like you, like, you have to stick up for yourself, but there's some limits, that'd be great. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's really important, especially a lot of kids don't have the guidance that they that they really need, and um, it would be great for maybe somebody that they could look up to to just hear a little bit of advice and hopefully maybe change some lives. Whatever's left of your camp, may you get through it safe. Safe travels to Brazil. Good luck against Vivian uh, Pereira. Is there anything you'd like to say to your fans or promote before we let you go? She can be followed, by the way, folks, on Twitter at Love Bo Jamie. Anything? Love Bo Jamie. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter. Uh, shout out to my gym, Syndicate MMA, one of the best gyms around. Um, yeah, that's it. Very <laughs> cool. And our previous guest can be followed on Twitter at Eric Spicely. Those were our two guests today. And thank you, Junkie Nation, for calling in and chiming in on that topic of TJ versus DJ or Borg versus DJ. And, of course, your thoughts on Whitaker and Romero is pleasant. Uh, pleasant chat all the way around. Dan Stubb, we'll see you tomorrow? Yep. Yep. All right, Jason B., you're still around, right? Yeah, I'm still and around. And Junkie Nation keeps growing out there. The annual Junkie Gathering just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Shout out to Paige from the UFC for bringing these two outstanding athletes by. Tomorrow we'll be joined by Vince Pichel, who will be fighting at UFC Fight Night 212 out in uh, New Zealand. Where are they going? New Zealand, Australia? New Zealand. New Zealand, right? Australia, Auckland. New Zealand? Auckland. Auckland, New Zealand. And we'll also be joined by Matthew Lopez, who will be joining... Jamie and Eric Spicely on that UFC uh, 212 card. So that should be some fun times. Back to the 1 p.m. Eastern start time, 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific. We got 15 seconds. What's the MMA history today? What was it? Um, speaking on theme of TJ Dillashaw, he knocked out Henry Burrow today in 2014 to capture the bantamweight title and shock the world. Shout out to at MMA history today for providing those. That is, uh, th that was a great event. I remember that Amazing. one. Amazing. That was during the Junkie Gathering. All right, folks. We're out of here. For Goes and Danny, Matt, uh, Michael back east, I'm George. Go out there, be champions. Go Man U.